Romanenko. I can see Mr. Romanenko here, among other cosmonauts, and Fedor Yurchekin, who, who has just landed. So nearly everybody is now seated. We apologize to the journalists because uh, there was uh, another thing going on. And I have already presented all the participants. And uh, this is Vitaly Davidov, who is uh, the first deputy. And uh, he'll be leading and beginning the press conference. He is the Roscosmos head deputy. Dear friends, dear colleagues, I'm glad to greet all of you here at MCC. You've seen everything with your own eyes. Everything was done nominally. The crew and uh, the equipment, the hardware performed perfectly, so they can proceed to, to the work straight away. Do you have any questions? Go ahead. I don't want to, to, to waste any time. Since we're talking about crew health, who have just arrived, I would like uh, to start with Rogozhin. But well, please, nobody, do not think that we have some health problems over there. Thank you. Health is very important indeed. Those cosmonauts, astronauts who have just docked, their health is fine, and uh, this was the same way during landing, uh, I'm sorry, during docking and during launch, and there are no, no whatsoever health problems. And the same goes for all those who are on board the station, who have been on board the station. If you want some more details and particularities, we have Mr. Bogomolov here, who can talk in more detail about all the flight stages and about uh, the cosmonauts' health on board the station. Thank you. Go ahead with the questions, please. Some colleagues of ours uh, from uh, ESA and uh, NASA, they wanted to uh, say something as well. We'll give them the opportunity later. First of all, I'd like to congratulate everybody here with this perfect docking, with uh, this one more achievement in our joint multilateral space program, Russian, European, and U.S., because uh, three representatives of three different space agencies are now on the vehicle. And I'm glad that everything is good as regards their health. I have a question about uh, the information which came in yesterday. Was there indeed an interruption in the space vehicle communication with MCC? Or is this something not as uh, strange or as serious as they used to write about this? Uh, Vladimir Solovyov will respond later. But, uh, uh, I'm going to say the following. Sometimes we are really surprised when we see in uh, mass media something which is uh, a true revelation to us. And the yesterday's event is uh, just like this. But I'd like to say the following. There was no serious problem. You understand very well what an MCC is. All the communication channels, all the loops have a back. Up. So, in case something had happened with MCC, the communication with the station can be upheld by a second backup MCC, which in this case was uh, MCC in Houston. You remember last time when there were some weather problems in Houston, there were no problems whatsoever now will come with the station. So, I'm really surprised that uh, uh, people talked about this so much. <coughs> well, I have already explained quite a lot of times before that, yes, indeed, such uh, cases do happen when cables burst, and this is not only on our side. Yes, indeed, on a kilometer 41, a cable bursted, but this didn't lead to anything at all. We managed to 
use our backup channels, our backup loops, and no communication, be it with the space station or with the Soyuz, was never interrupted. We didn't have any problems. And moreover, this was fixed very quickly. And as you just saw, we docked using our nominal loops. Ria Novosti, this is Kovalev. I would like to specify a kilometer 41. Uh, where was it exactly? And uh, was it indeed the way that this uh, fiberglass uh, optics uh, cable was uh, damaged? Uh, please do understand that the cable we are talking about, uh, this is uh, something that uh, we are renting. These are not our cables. This is a cable to just transmit the information. And uh, these cables are important to transfer different types of information. So it was not uh, for us to, to try and find out who was going to recover these loops and who is going to fix it. But was there or was there not a problem in communication? an interruption. This channel saw lots of information going through it. There was TV data, there was uh, telephone data. Then, of course, uh, there was uh, something wrong when it burst. But we had a parallel loop which was used, which was, which was in use. So the data exchange was never interrupted. There was a, a moment when the telephone, when telephone connection was interrupted, and then we transferred to another loop. This is called a voice loop. So this is the very, the very, the most important question. Yes. Yeah, so I'll continue once we've started talking about this. I would like somebody to say officially whether there will be a proton launch on the 20th, and if it does not occur, when it will take place. Officially, we're unable to say anything yet. You understand that this is the state commission, the state board that takes this decision. And uh, this commission will sit at the beginning of next week, and that's when they'll decide when the launch will take place. Will it happen before the end of the year? As of now, this launch is planned for 2010, and it hasn't been cancelled yet. <laughs> Could you say something about the preliminary conclusions made by the Commission? You know that uh, there was formed a commission, and uh, its president was uh, the president of uh, the main institute for machine building, and I'll give floor to him. The Commission is going on with its work. We had an interlapse, an interim period, and uh, that was to provide preliminary conclusion by the date of 15th. This conclusion has been elaborated. It was presented to the Roscosmos, and uh, in the same line as the previous question, everything was uh, very well planned, had been planned, and there were no objections, no remarks, no comments as regarding the first stage or the second stage or the third stage. And uh, there are no recommendations, no specific guidelines for the next launch. So everything is going on as it should have been. And we'll continue after the final conclusions made by the Commission. Now about the reason. The reason uh, that it was uh, brought into the miscalculated trajectory is that there was uh, too much oxygen used in the uh, and there was a mistake in the original formula in the instruction for fueling the vehicle. And uh, as there was uh, too much uh, mass, the rocket was simply unable to perform as it should have performed. And there were some small particularities which uh, were eliminated later. Wait a second. I would like to say something about this the next day. Next day, we'll see the official publication 
that uh, Gennady Raikunov uh, is preparing. Well, I can uh, read out loud something. And you'll see this also on Roscosmos's website. Well, if you have something, please read out loud. The Commission presented the preliminary conclusions as regarding the technical, uh, I'd like to underscore, technical of uh, the launch of uh, the proton rocket with uh, the GLONASS uh, machine apparatus. It's been established that uh, uh, the rocket did not achieve the necessary velocity, and that's why it was brought into the wrong trajectory. And then it uh, fell into the Pacific Ocean. The, uh, the objectives of the launch were not fulfilled. The reason was uh, the exceeded mass of the uh, main unit because of uh, the designer's thought as regarding uh, fueling it with uh, liquid oxygen. The designer of the system and the developer was RSC Energia. So in order to make the overall quantity of the apparatus be 324, we'll need to uh, finish this work by the end of the year. We wanted to listen to my opinion. I think it was a combination of both systems uh, factors and human factors. And uh, I would like to mention that the systems factors should, no, should never be interrupted or interfered in any way with the human factor. We need to continue our work and uh, to build a system which will prevent human factor from interfering. So there is something to think about and something to work on. This topic was not planned before. Let's not uh, talk about this prior to an official publication of Roscosmos on its website. All right, dear colleagues, let's make use of this opportunity and I would like to give floor to our colleagues, to the deputy of uh, uh, the NASA program, Mr. Sherman. So good evening. Uh, first off, I'd like to congratulate uh, the crew for an excellent docking and, and of course, my Russian colleagues for a, a beautiful vehicle and uh, a great ground crew that made it all successful. Uh, the honor, honor vehicle is performing well, uh, and of course it's great to have six people on board the International Space Station yet again. Корабль, станция, собственно, орбитальный комплекс работает штатно, все в порядке. В особенности приятно, что мы восстановили состав экипажа, э, вернули его к составу 6 человек, что очень приятно, потому что мы много работали для того, чтобы достичь такого уровня. Uh, the crew has a very busy time between now and the end of February. We'll have a progress docking, uh, a Japanese HTV docking, uh, a European ATV docking, and uh, a shuttle docking as well. Экипажу придется засучить рукава и поработать на славу, потому что программа и график представляются весьма и весьма насыщенными. Начнется все в конце января с российского грузового корабля «Прогресс», затем пойдет европейский грузовой корабль «ATV-2», затем японский грузовой корабль «HTV», после этого «Шаттл», uh, and this very evening, the shuttle is undergoing a test in Florida where they're loading the cryogenic propellant uh, into the external tank and taking some critical data, some measurements. Uh, and that's an important step in allowing us to fly that shuttle in February. Uh, I understand that test went very well, and they're completing that test right now. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing the shuttle up there uh, with this ISS crew here in early February. Кстати говоря, раз уж мы заговорили о полете шаттла, то я хотел бы сообщить присутствующим, что сегодня на Флориде проводился очень важный тест, заправочный тест 
наружный бак полностью заправлялся криогенным топливом и выполнялся ряд замеров, ряд параметров измерялся с тем, чтобы определиться, насколько бак готов к предварительному, назначенному на 3 февраля 2011 года Спасибо, Гир. И Ирина Пишель, пожалуйста. Thank you. А, ну хорошо. Андрей Шон, представитель офиса программы МКС. So I'm representative of uh, the office of, of the ISS program. So this shows that this is really a, an international program. And we are very happy of having the ESA astronaut of Italian nation uh, Paolo Nespoli now on board the station. Прежде всего хочу поблагодарить своих российских коллег, наших российских коллег за прекрасное обеспечение безопасности на борту. Я, как и все мои коллеги по Европейскому космическому агентству, очень рады, что к экипажу наконец присоединился европейский астронавт. Это итальянский астронавт Паоло Несполи. As Kirk has already mentioned, we're going to launch the ATV in February. Этому экипажу предстоит очень напряженный период работы. Как уже упомянул Кирк, предстоит в феврале стыковка ATV европейского грузового корабля. And the shuttle will bring the uh, permanent uh, storage module, uh, um, remodeled uh, MPLM to the station, which was built in Italy. Также с помощью шаттла будет запущен модуль для постоянный модуль, который будет модуль MPLM, который был создан в Италии. And we also have a very uh, challenging and interesting science program to be performed on orbit. So we are looking forward to that increment. And thanks again to our Russian colleagues for bringing the crew to the station. Кроме того, предусмотрена очень насыщенная и интересная программа научных исследований, которая будет реализована всем экипажем, в том числе и российскими космонавтами. Так, вопросы, друзья мои. So, questions, please. If uh, you are not interested in asking que ask questions, you can ask some cosmonauts that we have here. I have a question about uh, what uh, Mr. Schultz said about the scientific program. Uh, there was a promise some time ago that there will be a program developed together with the Russian Academy of Science because the cosmonauts uh, say sometimes that they have, do not have uh, enough science on board. So how is it going in this uh, area? This program is actually going on. We have lots of different offers, but it cannot occur in a second. At least because uh, the hardware, the equipment that we need to install, any type of equipment, which uh, may be simple for manned cosmonautics, is not something that which can be manufactured very quickly and uh, sent to, say, a shop or a store. So this is something which needs to be uh, manufactured for a long time. And then, moreover, this is not something that we can uh, uh, send up there without having checked it thoroughly. So that's why everything is uh, being checked and certified for a very long time. It's been, it is tested, verified, and uh, and such. So I'd like to confirm the words which have been mentioned before that this work is going on, that we have lots of offers, at least. Uh, Around 84 experiments have been selected, and uh, they are right now on a waiting list, so to speak.
Before we uh, sort of had to use uh, and to uh, send to do an experiment which, we, which was offered. But now we have lots of different offers and we have a possibility to select and choose. But this is not a matter of uh, a week or even a month. This is a longer term. And we also need to prepare the crew to perform such work. But I do hope that the results will be outstanding as well. And real life shows that uh, the preparation takes at least uh, six months. Uh, sometimes it may be uh, 12 months, give or take. And I'm, taking about, I'm talking about uh, real scientific experiments, co complex experiments. Uh, say now Tsunimash is uh, uh, getting ready for a new modification, uh, scientific equipment to explore atmosphere the ultraviolet range, and this is not the first modification. We started when we had the MERS station, and now we are continuing. And I'd say this is something that uh, has nothing similar in the world, and uh, we hope that, uh, and even preliminary results do show this, that uh, the overall findings, the very final findings, will be something extraordinary, never seen before on a large scale, which has never been before as well. Here we are talking about uh, influence on uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, the atmosphere, I'm talking about troposphere and other layers, because before this such experiments, such uh, uh, research has been conducted from the ground. And now we can see how this influences health, ecology, and this shows that uh, the atmosphere is subject to much more complex physical processes than we supposed before, and so on. So well, if we are talking about this type of hardware, it's really complex. It's And uh, equipment such as uh, Fialka was uh, ordered uh, before by such companies uh, uh, space laboratory from Salt Lake City. We cooperated with them for a long time and they used to purchase this equipment. And uh, I can even say that such equipment that we produced was uh, at least as good as that from other countries or maybe even better. And uh, due to this, we are receiving very interesting results. I'd like to add something. First of all, I'd like to underline that as of today, we have an agreement in place that we have signed with uh, the European Space Agency on scientific experiments. And this is something that our European colleagues mentioned. This program about joint experiments that we worked out, and uh, we worked it out because we had some mutual interest and we are interested in uh, the uh, final results. And uh, these experiments uh, are done both on the Russian side and the European side. Second, we've seen the very first uh, signs of uh, uh, commercial experiments. By the way, such experiments were suggested by our old uh, friends uh, from Space Adventures, Orbital Technologies. Space Adventures is in the U.S. as a U.S. company, and Orbital Technologies is a Russian company. But they deal with the same thing. And what they produced uh, is uh, a small program that uh, has some commercial interest in it. Uh, this interest uh, has been shown by certain pharmaceutical companies, medicine, medical preparations. Uh, so this is a new angle that uh, Russian science on water station has now. By the way, we've seen uh, a series of uh, negotiations this year, and uh, we talked about different uh, experiments, and I think this is something which will have interest as well. This is uh, not just experiments of Russia and U.S., but these are experiments which are done between different companies. And now this, what I said, was about ISTEC. See how, 
how relevant your question was. And now I'd like to say something as well. It may be that we will uh, think about uh, some new vision, some new form. Uh, probably after each increment we'll provide a report, the results we saw, what was done, but uh, we just need to understand that there will be uh, some lapse, some period of time before we'll get these results, because uh, it will take some time. Uh, the owners of the experiment will take in order to process the results. And then we'll see what we really get after those experiments on board the ISS. And I'm going to add a few words. Each vehicle that is going up there brings uh, some hardware and certain components for different experiments. For example, this vehicle is uh, bringing or has brought hardware equipment for seven rather long-term experiments. Uh, these are experiments on distance uh, probing of the Earth planet. There are also spectral and uh, different other types of uh, measurement instruments. Uh, there are some experiments that have been gone for some time. Uh, this is on a psychological compatibility and different situations which might be difficult for explorers in order to see and to research how people react and how they communicate when they've been in space for a long time. And there is also an experiment on mutual cooperation. This experiment, which is called Matroshka, which has been there for a long time, and it's also seeing new equipment being added to it. And we're measuring the, the radiation surroundings. We're also exploring uh, blood systems under different loads. Pneumocard it is also a medical and biological experiment. So the work is going on constantly. And uh, when I hear that some people say that our cosmonauts are not really doing anything there, this is something which should not be said because we have lots of work to do and we want to do even more. But uh, you'd I want you to bear in mind that the cosmonaut is the one who is preparing this experiment, who is uh, setting it in motion, then sending the results to the ground. But more often than not, a cosmonaut is a passive observer. And of course he wants to be to play an active part, and he wants to take an active part, he wants to participate, and this, is, this can be easily psychologically explained, because we always think that, yes, we want to do something else and something else. We work on this. There are certain interesting things, uh, different types of scientific organizations prepare experiments, and lots of them do not pass the expertise and uh, the tests on the ground, which we are supposed to do prior to sending it all to the station. Uh, that's why uh, these types of equipment cannot be brought to the station. We also agreed with our partners and our colleagues that when conducting those experiments, we're going to use any type of hardware which can be found on board the International Space Station. So we're looking forward to receiving new interesting ideas, new proposals, new offers. And uh, what is going on right now is uh, an inventory of uh, all types of hardware that each side has. And hopefully in the near future, we'll discuss all the possibilities which are there on board the station. More questions, please? So we are the only one who got all the questions. So next time we'll invite only one journalist. I have one more question. And this is about uh, expanding European participation. I know there have been uh, some talks about uh, uh, increasing number of European astronauts who go to space. But the problem was that we don't have enough, uh, uh, enough uh, places on the Russian vehicles. Are there any projects, any prospects? 
aspects uh, that now that we do not have uh, enough uh, uh, scientific clothes to replace one Russian cosmonaut with European astronaut on one source vehicle probably once a year. No, that's not something we are going to do. I would like to assure you that uh, all those rumors that are, which are going on, that uh, are going on like this, that Russian cosmos have nothing to do on board the station, and uh, replacing Russian cosmos with uh, the European colleagues is not something we are considering. Even though you did uh, say, uh, right, that uh, such an idea was brought up, we are discussing this issue, it's very complex, and this is uh, primarily uh, because of, uh, not because of there is not enough room on the Russian vehicles, this is because uh, the space station is designed for six people, even though before that we had planned there will be, there will be seven people on board. This additional Soyuz that you are always asking about, this is uh, in case we are talking about a long-term flight, a two-month flight or a, two, or a three month flight. Uh, this is uh, something that our colleagues are interested in. Such an additional Soyuz will lead to the following fact. This means that for this uh, long period of time, a two months or three months, the station will see nine people. Russian systems are not designed for such such a number. And the same goes for U.S. systems. And that's why uh, not even a bilateral but a trilateral process will be required. And we'll, we would need to look into whether we can technically allow for uh, so many people for two months or three months. And I'm talking about uh, uh, that period when uh, we have only three people on board the station we are using this period. We'll have nine people and how much it will cost in terms of resources, expenses made by our partners and uh, whether this can be afforded. So this issue has been raised, and we are going to look into it later, but we have no ready answers for it. Thank you. So no more questions? Are you exhausted? We've been here for a second day, it, and it is already past midnight. Yeah, it's midnight. So, was this all? Thank you. And once again, this is Mission Control Korolev uh, following the successful docking of Soyuz TMA-20 to the Rosviet module. You're looking live at a picture of the newly arrived Soyuz that carried uh, Soyuz Commander Dmitry Kondratiev and Flight Engineers Katie Coleman of NASA and Paolo Nespoli of the European Space Agency to their new home for the next five months. The Rosviet module docked uh, to the Earth-facing port of the Zarya module of the International Space Station as uh, the ISS and its six crew members now fly from northwest to southeast in an orbit inclined 51.6 degrees to either side of the equator, just to the southeast of the New Caledonia Island chain over the Pacific Ocean. All of the systems in the Soyuz are in excellent shape. While we were uh, providing the uh, post-docking news conference for you on NASA television, uh, the confirmation had been received just before the news conference began that hooks and latches had closed to form a hard mate between the Soyuz and the Rosviet module docking port. About 15 minutes later, uh, some 25 minutes ago, uh, the hatch was opened uh, between the descent module, uh, where the crew is strapped in for launch and landing, and the upper module uh, of the three-compartment Soyuz vehicle, that is the orbital or habitation module, that uh, has permitted uh, Dmitry Kondratiev, the Soyuz commander, followed by Katie Coleman and Paolo Nespoli, to doff their Sokol launch and entry suits and to get into more comfortable clothing. 
for the next uh, couple of hours as they uh, begin the process of performing leak checks on their side of the docking interface between Soyuz and Rosviet, as will uh, Alexander Kaleri and Alex Gripochka on the station side of the docking interface. That will lead uh, to the opening of the hatches uh, between Soyuz and Rosviet about uh, two hours from now. Uh, we're expecting that to occur just after 5 p.m. Central Time, just after 2 a.m. Moscow Time here on Saturday morning. Number one, are you loud and clear? Ten minute uh, leak check. Interface leak check. As uh, mentioned before, four Russian vehicles now at the uh, International Space Station, two Soyuz vehicles for the six crew members, two Russian Progress Resupply vehicles. The docking occurred uh, right on time, just uh, a little less than an hour ago. We have a, a brief clip uh, to show you of the final seconds before contact and capture as uh, the Soyuz, uh, there you see it, uh, from cameras on the International Space Station, closing uh, the final few feet for contact and capture. Now the view from the Soyuz vehicle, the docking occurring at 11.11 p.m. Moscow time, 2.11 p.m. Central time, as uh, the Soyuz and the International Space Station sail 224 statute miles over the southwest corner of the Republic of Mali in western Africa. Again, you're looking right in the middle of your picture at the newly arrived uh, Soyuz TMA-20 as uh, Soyuz Commander Dmitry Kondratiev and Flight Engineers Katie Coleman of NASA and Paul Hello, Nespoli of uh, the European Space Agency uh, begin the procedures of leak checks on their side of the docking interface, as are their three uh, soon-to-be uh, roommates for the next several months, Station Commander Scott Kelly, along with Alexander Kaleri and Alex Gripochka conducting leak checks on their side of the docking interface to set the stage for the opening of the hatches between the two vehicles about two hours from now and the initial greetings and the welcoming ceremony that will take place from the balcony overlooking the International Space Station Flight Control Room here at Mission Control in Korolyov. So that's it uh, for now. We'll be back on the air at 4.30 p.m. Central Time, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time with hatch opening coverage and the welcoming ceremony between uh, the current Expedition 26 crew and the new trio of Expedition 26 crew members who have arrived at the International Space Station. For now, we'll see you back here at 4.30 p.m. Central Time for hatch opening coverage. This is Mission Control Koryov.